it's live it's happening right now is it yo yeah man we're happy to have you i'm a fan of your content as well i definitely watch it to stay uh a praise of what's going on in current world events oh my god dog oh my god shall we watch this sh it really sucks too because there is nobody in that studio that's gonna and he's saying i love your stuff man they're just gonna let him ride man they're just gonna let him ride they're gonna let him say whatever he wants there's gonna be no pushback man there's gonna be none he goes in there he's gonna say Zelensky's hitler he's gonna go in there he's gonna say Zelensky's this he's gonna go he's gonna go in there say anything anything and they're just gonna be like okay okay neither of them are equipped to deal with this situation neither of them are equipped to give him any pushback man huh. but i mean it's not that surprising that like the red pill space would be open to you know the type of reactionary politics that jackson hinkle pushes i mean i think the the whole idea of like the the russia's destiny of pushing back against the degenerate the russian idea russians destiny this war of purification against the degenerate west right a lot of the narratives that is played by russian conservatives russian nationalists in service of that maybe the russian theocrats in service of this idea of this purification war this quest against degeneracy I mean, it's not, it's not going to be hard to sell that to, I think, a red pill audience on top of what I've already said. I mean, a lot, if you look at a lot of the stuff that Jackson Hinkle and people like him publish, a lot of it is quite literally, look at the liberal soy dumb, and we were just looking at this er earlier with the Soviet post, liberal soy dumb West in the Chad masculine, awesome authoritarian, and then it could be maybe communist, or maybe it's just like a, not even a communist, it's just like a, like a kleptocrat. I've seen him like praise a lot of african kleptocrats recently uh, and other kleptocrats like it but whatever it is it's one side soy and one side's masculine and that type of messaging is something that russia plays into a ton and that's also messaging that plays a lot in red pill spaces so he it's like a prime audience prime audience i think for the russian right not to mention it's a very disaffected probably a lot of disaffected men they're not are not hard to radicalize either i just man sucks it's a perfect audience for him you see dylan he has to praise the anti-communist kleptocrats because of multipolarity ah true Dude, that's why well, that's why we're seeing so many people flip on saudi arabia recently because it was always for jackson up until recently the saudi butchers like helped by the united states until very recently and now it's like saudi arabia you know looking out for its own interest and a multipolar now like it's it's changed now that saudi arabia is 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 i think practicing some strategic hedging do i actually spend time to watch this guys i think it would it might make sense I feel like it's boring i think so i think so we should do it okay let's see how it goes And uh, we got to kill the Twitch stream, guys, because he's banned on Twitch. <laughs> yeah, so let's come over a bit and or come on over to um, YouTube. And shout out to all the Z's in the chat. Yeah, all the Z's, Z's, Z's in the chat. Yeah, I see let's it. Go. I see it. Shout out to all, all you guys. Uh, shout out to all the Z's in the chat. Does he know? Like, it's like just like a pro-Russia, like pro-invasion message. How much do these guys know about the war? Like, genuinely. Do these guys talk? Did these guys, these guys like, oh, we're going to have Timothy Snyder on next week. Week after that, we're going to have some like on the ground. I have a, I have a weird feeling that's not happening. Z's in the chat. Z's in the chat. I don't know how you can host a podcast, a podcast in the United States and be like Z's in the chat. And look, I don't, I just think he probably doesn't know maybe much about the war, or maybe it's just like, ah, it's a joke, it's whatever. But when you look at how Russia treats political dissidents, treats uh, even the people that are in favor of the war in the wrong way, and they're getting arrested, those dissidents. Z's in the chat, aligning themselves with them, whatever, we'll see, we'll see. Out there, man. Um, this is a collab that you guys have waiting for, our, for a while. Um, quick announcement before we get into the show. Guys, we are officially live castleclub.tv is yes. the new website guys castleclub.tv that is where you can get the full podcast us kicking out annoying girls all the stuff behind the scenes that you guys can't get anywhere else go ahead check us out over there we're going to be doing zoom calls out of there streams out of there everything is going to be out of 
castleclub.tv, man. It's only 20 bucks to join. Uh, and yeah, it goes to supporting because you guys know we're all demonetized here at the table. So we'd appreciate if you goes. He understands guys go how we feel. Support. Yeah, he knows as well. Uh, guys, c- telling the truth comes at a cost. <laughs> so uh, we'd really appreciate that if you guys joined. Um, but yeah, castleclub.tv. Um, and then what else here? We got. Um, that's pretty much it. Yeah, Rumble.com slash Fresh and Fit, man. Without further ado, we got a special guest in the house, Jackson Hinkle. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm a big fan of the show. Yeah, man, we're happy to have you. I'm a fan of your content as well. I definitely watch it to stay uh, appraised of what's going on in current world events. Mm-hmm. Um, so we know who you are, but the audience. I mean, like, what what events? Was I, I just want to hear like, what what events? What events did Jackson Inkle give you vital information on that increased your knowledge? That like gave you a good foundation to build on? Was it when he lied that Butcher was actually done by the Ukrainians, and when more evidence came out? just kind of stop talking about it was it the a million times he's talked about like imminent collapse of ukrainian forces and it hasn't happened was it when he brought on convicted sex offender scott ritter pedophile mind you who said that he had he resorted to pedophilia because he was getting bullied due to his critiques of the iraq war he has him on to talk about the war and just an open Russian propagandist who is a Russian propagandist because he can't get employment anywhere else because he's a pedophile and no one wants to hire him. Except for the traditionalist Russian media. Or is it when he had Douglas McGregor on? Somebody who says that Ukraine's going to collapse every other week. In fact, I think he said it five or six times that Ukraine's going to collapse in a week, and it hasn't. So what, I, what analysis has he provided about world events that is, that is informing people? It isn't just narrative humping. This might not know who you are. Can you please introduce yourself to the people? Of course. My name's Jackson Hinkle. Uh, I just moved to Miami. I love it here. It's, uh, I'm getting used to the heat. But I, I grew up in uh, Orange County, California, 23 years old, about to be 24. And uh, what can I say? I, I, too, have learned my lesson from the overlords at YouTube. I now understand that Zelensky's a very good, honorable man. Nina Dahl is an honorable woman, and uh, she did nothing wrong, and and I'm just happy to be here, you know? <laughs> wise man. Very wise man. Oh, man. And don't worry, guys. You're going to get the real raw on Rumble uh, when we switch over there. But um, so uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, man. So you said you're from Orange County, California. What was what was that like growing up over there, bro? Uh, it, it's my foundation that I think, uh, you know, as you get older and older, you begin to come back to who you were as a kid. And, you know— he was a Bernie guy, by the way. He was a Bernie guy as a kid. We're actually Bernie people at the same age. Yeah, a little bit of a different transformation, huh? I went through a I went through a stage of my life where I was definitely like liberal, lefty, whatever. I was doing like a lot of weed and smoking and drinking a lot. Mm-hmm. Definitely not a good part of my life. I wasn't working out. And through the good grace of God, you know, people like you, people like uh... through the good grace of God, I thought, God damn. Isn't ethnic cleansing fucking awesome? I got out of it. God was like, Jackson, go endorse the largest war in Europe since World War II. Endorse the invaders. Endorse the butchers of Bucha. Filling up mass graves is God's work. You know, Jesus filled up a lot of mass graves. I I mean, he'd fill up every village he went to. He filled up a mass grave to to prove a point, to prove the Russian idea. Uh, Tate, whoever, you know, they've they've really uplifted a generation of men again who were just manipulated and propagandized with all this liberal nonsense. It's very funny to hear him say he gave up the weed and the porn and all of that and then talk about how an Internet pimp is helping the youth. And you see it. You see what it's doing to our country. It's really sick. It's they tell you it's liberalism. It's they're going to give you freedom and whatnot, but it, it gives you freedom from god freedom from family freedom from tradition and your nation and you can still go to church you can still worship god you can do any of that if you still want to um it's just it's just so strange to see him constantly praise another country while like the liberals don't really believe in freedom that's why i support some of the most repressive regimes in the world because they have freedom from homosexuality and that's a positive in my book which see, seems to be the logic. When you see him narrative humping on Twitter, you'll see him like praising regimes for like, oh, they banned the gays or they banned this thing that's semi woke. But then he'll decry attacks on freedom. 
But then the attacks on freedom in the United States is going to be talking about. It's like, I got banned on Twitter. And then he'll go online and like praise like, yeah, anti-gay propaganda law. Arrest the queers. Arrest the queers. There's no desire for freedom in his mind. Freedom is merely a tool to achieve to achieve something on his own behalf for, for the Germans. And I hate to make uh, the, you know what? I won't make the German comparison, right? I don't want to, I don't want to compare Jackson Hinkle to the great German people. That'd be very mean to them. But anytime anyone who is illiberal wants to take over any liberal state or any country that has liberal social values or liberal views when it comes to civil protections and, and your ability to freely protest, those tools will be available and be used by them until they can be used by them as well. Freedom of expression until you're in the position of power, then you stop your opposition from freely expressing themselves. I mean, Jackson Hinkle isn't the only person, I think, in American politics who kind of, um, I think, show, you know, embodies this kind of idea of, of using those freedoms for yourself while trying to actively be celebrate and be happy for when those freedoms are taken away from other people. Donald Trump, for example, was someone who was openly in favor of banning, burning the American flag. And look, I have an American flag in my background. I love the United States, but I believe the First Amendment is across the board fundamental, and you should be able to critique your government in the most offensive of ways. Because once you give them a little bit of power to crack down on that, there's a fear that they will build up and go further and it won't just stop at that little power they'll take even more power i don't like the idea of governments regulating speech in that way but it's just i don't believe he really cares about freedom i just think he cares about freedom for himself so orange county is a very patriotic place it's uh very conservative mm -hmm. great weather it's uh you know i had a great high school i can't uh say anything bad about it i had an awesome family it's right outside of la right uh yeah it's about yeah. Hour About south an hour of LA, so, yeah, far enough south where there's no uh, tweakers or crack addicts on the street, and it's uh, shit. fantastic, yeah, yeah, no, it's it's very nice. But anyways, I surfed a lot, played basketball, did a uh, track all throughout high school, and uh, was really into sports. And then got a little bit older, didn't go to college, and uh, I ran for mayor in my hometown, and I you ran for mayor, yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, I ran when I was 18, I lost, and then I ran when I was 19 again, and I got really close. And I, I honestly am thankful that I lost because it set me on the trajectory to where I am now. I started a YouTube channel where I focus on foreign policy mm -hmm. and war. And even as uh, you know, a lefty, I supported Bernie Sanders, and I thought to myself, well, Bernie Sanders is calling out the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war. Yeah. He's calling out uh, what's going on in Syria, for example, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Called out other things that we're not going to mention here. But it's so sad because all these people who were once at least somewhat good on issues and matters of foreign policy, they're now just becoming tools. And You know, yeah. it's the, the thing that gets me is about the YouTube censorship stuff. I, I know one thing that YouTube's really trigger happy on is is COVID. Anytime you even say it, you're risking something. But they're talking about the war in Ukraine. He regularly talks the most bizarre stuff on the war in Ukraine on his YouTube channel. He's, I think, pretty open about that. He can express his bare opinions on it on YouTube. Unless he's call, talking like, at, calling for like acts of violence or I think maybe denying certain war crimes that happened, maybe. But he can express the the bulk of his opinions on it with, with no, I don't think, any real problem. The apparatus of uh, the deep sea. I saw Bernie Sanders this week. He was criticizing Cornell West, who's running as a Green Party candidate. It's like, what? who cares about that? What yeah. The, what is a Green Party? Yeah, exactly. So he, <laughs> he's just towing the DNC line. And anyway, so. He's not running again, right? Uh, no, 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 yeah. no, no. But long story short, I uh, through my YouTube show, I think I just slowly but surely arrived at a position where i mean you can't look at the world in any other place than but understand that in america what we read what we really need right now is god we need traditional values we need to have anti-war candidates i think trump is that man for 2024 who are going to be on the ballot i would like to hear jackson hinkle explain his logic if he's voting for trump and he's the anti-war candidate what is Jackson Hinkle going to do if Trump gets in there and he just reverses everything like he does on his positions all the time? Because Trump flip flops on his positions on war all the time, like for on Syria. He, one week, we got to literally stay in Syria to loot the oil. Next week, we got to pull out. It's a waste of time. Next week, we got to stay in. Next week, the Kurds were not with us a D-Day. Let's pull out. 
right? North Korea. Oh, we need to make a real commitment to bringing peace to the Korean Peninsula. Now that we've reached this table with Kim Jong Un, we're gonna just make no real offer. Sorry, and then it falls apart. And Trump's already said on the campaign trail multiple times that he's, you know, vaguely against the aid. He's against sending all this aid to Ukraine. He's going to end the war in 24 hours. But on the other hand, he's also said that if the Russians don't come to the table and agree with his proposed great deal, then he's going to give Ukraine more aid than ever before. He's going to double it or triple it. Now, now odds are that doesn't happen, right? But that is something he's floating out there. And I think this is like, like Trump just to throw a bunch of things at the wall, you know, a bunch of ideas he thinks is bright but hasn't run by anyone. But what would he do if, if Trump, when he got in the office, you know, he gets he gets smoozed by Zelensky and he's got smoozed by other world leaders in the past. And he's like, OK, you know what? I'm actually going to double aid because I think this is a great investment for the United States. Have you seen how much oil is in Ukraine? You could completely switch our logic for the war. I think our logic now is better. But I'm just saying it's not a complete non possibility. And this is the danger of anyone supporting Trump is Trump could kind of just. Go with the wind. And a lot of people who write about the Trump presidency say that the, the stuff that Trump goes with is a lot of times just whatever is whispered in his ear by one of his aides last. And uh, we need to have peace, and we don't have a lot of that right now. We have a bunch of warmongers, and we have a bunch of people pushing. Trump, bringing Trump in to push against the warmongers, just to remind everybody that Trump assassinated Soleimani. Just throwing it out there, which Jackson was greatly opposed to, any increased drone strikes by like 100% to 150% while in office. Just throwing that out there. Also, Joe Biden has decreased drone strikes by about 90 to 95%. Not trying to simp too hard for Joe Biden, just putting the facts on the table so people know them. Things that I think uh, are ultimately bad for humanity. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. Said. Uh, uh, well said. I'm just curious, because uh, you mentioned you were liberal before. What was the breaking point for you to turn to conservative? So the soys. That's that might be a rumble conversation. Okay, okay. We'll but uh, you know, there there's there's a lot of insanity in the world. Uh, Dude, every time he says that, I just imagine he's like thinking like he's just like a million slurs just like racing through his head. Oh, you want to know who pushed me that way? This fat fuck named Dylan. No, I just I I'm just trying to imagine like all the things racing through his head that he can't even say it on YouTube. Like, oh, it's so scary. We gotta, we gotta be on Rumble. What? Okay. Uh, saying that I'm not bothering. Look, I don't even really want to watch this. I'm not bothering to go to Rumble to check. That the sky's not blue. Saying that you know, up is down and left is right. Mm -hmm. And uh, whatever you're looking at, whether it's our cultural views or whether it's the war and stuff like that, um, you know, it, it's it's so bad now that if you simply call into question what they're doing on the mainstream media, they'll never have you back on again. If you call into question on YouTube, they'll they'll, they'll do what they did to you guys and yeah. what they've done to me over a year ago now. They permanently demonetize my account. They banned me twice on YouTube. They banned me three times on Twitter, one time under Elon, so four times in total. They banned me permanently on Twitch. They banned me from PayPal. They banned me from Venmo. They banned Yo, I would like to see Jackson Hinkle. I, I'm just throwing this out there as somebody who has simped so much for the Russian regime. I would like to see him try to complain about being a dissident instead of Russia instead. Like, he's saying all this about, like, oh, I got, you know, I demonetized on YouTube. So now I'm just making thousands upon thousands of dollars on Twitter and other platforms. And, oh, you know, I've, oh, I'm being so suppressed. But also, my Twitter following is like 400,000. I'm being so suppressed. And he's like going through all these different reasons as to why, you know, this crackdown against him for speaking the truth. I'd like to see him switched out with a Russian dissident for a day. Just for a day. Like, oh, my friend was poisoned. Oh, my other one fell off of a tall building. Oh, their plane went. Rawr. I just, you know, for, for this type of like anger at, you know, your speech being repressed, it seems like he's only angry when his speech is repressed. I mean, principally, that is. Because if, 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 if he was as much of a free speech activist as he pretends to be, I don't think he would be willing to overlook all those instances in Russia and participate in the Russian media machine, which helps facilitate that crackdown. 
banned me from multiple merchandise wow. stores. They banned me from everywhere just because of what I have to say about this new multipolar world that's coming into order and uh, what's happening with Russia, what's happening with China, what's happening even with Saudi Arabia right now, what's yeah. happening with these wars and how we need to push for a peace deal. And isn't that crazy that yeah. you push for peace and they're just like, oh, yeah, take his PayPal away. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's wild. Yeah. But w that's, you know, I'm sure that's exactly why they took his PayPal away. He went on YouTube and he looked at the camera and he, and he you know, he, oh, war is bad. And then they just took away all of his money. That, that must have been it. It couldn't have been the denying of the Bucha massacre or any of the other war crimes that he tried to cover up and deny was done by the Russians, even though the evidence makes it 100% clear now and he continues to deny. It couldn't have been anything like that. It has to just be because he came out and said, peace is good. Russell Brand, somebody who I still think is 100% wrong in the war, he comes out and says peace is good all the time. Channel's fine. And for all these complaints, Jackson's still on YouTube. By the way, what when we talk about these, these social media platforms like Twitter and the censorship that was on there, how many of these social media platforms are available in... You know what? I don't want to stick too much on the Russian censorship question because I feel like I'll just start to sound like a broken record. But God, man, I just don't... I just, I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it that one day he just said, oh, we're, we're all at peace. We love peace over here so much. And it wasn't any of the other horrendous things that Jackson Hinkle has said. What is it? The agenda doesn't want that. They want it to go through. So, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, sorry, continue. You were, you were saying. No, I mean, it's crazy. And, and at the core of it all is communism because I'm a communist. I'm a MAGA communist. And MAGA is the heart and soil of our country. I mean, if you really. Th at least this lets me know this is never going to be serious. I'm. This this stuff like here, what he's saying right here, at least allows me to live in the solace that he's just going to be like an Alex Jones type for forever. Think about it. MAGA isn't even, you know, a puppet of Donald Trump. When Donald Trump started talking about, you know, the jabs and whatnot, MAGA was pushing back on him. If Donald Trump came out tomorrow and started saying positive things about uh, Zelensky, uh, I think MAGA would push back on him. And mm -hmm. at its core, MAGA is a partisan movement that is pushing for the interest. I think, I think when Trump said that he could go into Fifth Avenue, shoot somebody and not lose supporters, I don't think it was 100% true, but I think it was like 90% true. I think he'd keep a decent chunk of his supporters. Um, I, I do think a lot of MAGA is just the cult personality around Trump. And if Trump was to change his mind tomorrow, a lot of them would file in lockstep behind him. A lot. Uh, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them would interest of the working man the working man in america doesn't need more war doesn't need you know blackrock and vanguard buying up more shares of comcast it doesn't need uh you know our the working man never needed more war there was never a time in history where the working man was like god I just... if only i had to go over there and shoot somebody that would give me uh the war that i need uh, it would help me a lot that's not a thing sometimes wars are necessary in self-defense you know sometimes you know, maybe there's like a terrorist situation that people need to get involved in. Wars are not like pleasant things that you want to do. At least if you're not like a fascist imperialist conqueror or you're not going out and starting the wars. For example, George Bush and the invasion of Iraq. Or I would give a more obvious example, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, this is a war that was pushed on Ukraine and pushed on the people who signed the Budapest Memorandum, like the United States, to support Ukraine and promise to support Ukraine. Or those others that helped promise to support Ukraine or stood behind Ukraine. It isn't that, oh, the working man wants another war, even though Americans aren't even dying in this war unless you go over there to volunteer. It's that the Russians have started a war and self-defense is sometimes necessary. Like, the working man doesn't need to shoot anyone, right? That's not something the working man needs. But if a burglar breaks into your house with a knife, not wearing any pants, with a twitch in his eye, right? I think that day you might, by necessity, need to shoot someone. Or industry being outsourced to China or Taiwan or Indonesia or wherever, mm -hmm. the working man in America would benefit greatly if we followed an integrated path of economic cohesion like we see in 
China, for example, or, or the foundation of Russia, centralization of our public commodities like oil, natural gas. Every person needs oil. Every person needs natural gas. Every person needs food and the fertilizer that makes it. But right now we have this rich horde of elites that are hoarding all elite counter. We got one. OK, one. See how many more we get today. Elite. I love the vague. I love the vague term. I love the word elite because Putin is an elitist. The people around him, the oligarchs that support him, whether they manage the defense companies in Russia or otherwise, they're they're part of the elite. So when somebody says the elites, it's just it's like a buzzword to narrative hump, I think, most of the time. I just when somebody says elite, I want them to be more specific. Like uh the American bankers or the bankers in the United States would be something like, oh, the people who manage big finance, specifically these types of it never gets into those types of specifics because when you use the word elite. It's kind of like a fill in the blank for anybody that's watching from Fresh and Fit. Because if you're from Jackson audience and you hear elite, you're going to be probably thinking like Victoria Newland. Maybe you're going to be thinking someone like George Soros, where somebody in the audience might be hearing elite and they might be putting in maybe even more nefarious answer, like a minority group of some sort, like the Jews, or maybe some other political figure or, or group in their mind. For example, maybe somebody's thinking like the ADL or or some other organization. So by just using the word elites, even though many of these elites have competing interests, for example, there are, there are lobbyist groups on both sides of many political issues, um, or there's different political like parties that have different elites that often compete, uh, that just the word elite casts such a wide net. It's very good for pushing a narrative. Of our resources uh, away from the working people. I'm not saying that anytime anyone uses the word elite, that's how it's being used, but that's how it can be used. People and preventing our country from actually prospering and developing, like we're seeing in China right now, which lifted 840 million people out of poverty in the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. So wow. we're yeah. going backwards. Yeah, yeah. it's very bad. Corrupt, bankrupt There's man. been a lot of talk, and you've talked about this as well with BRICS. And um, cool your jets. Thank you so much for the primer being set for six months. Thank you for your great perspectives. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Can we just get the I don't want to listen to the brick stuff, man. It's just going to be like de dollarization is speeding up more than ever. We're going to have Ethiopia. We're going to have Egypt. We're going to have Argentina. We're going to have all these oil producers. We're going to control all the oil and we're going to destroy the dollar. The dollar is going down. And in, in the, the dollarization is like probably like 30, 40, 50 years off at the like l at the earliest. We got 59% 59, 59 of the world reserve currency is the dollar. Is that down from its earlier high 20 something years ago of what? I think it was like 79%. That's true. But the dollar, but the currencies that have taken up the space are the euro at 20%. Then I believe it's a Japanese yen. I think then after the Japanese yen, I think it's the Chinese, I think it's the Australian or Canadian dollar, then Chinese currency, then I think, again, one of either the Australians or the Canadians, then I think the Swiss, and then I forget who's after that. I think it's the other category in the graphs I was looking at. Now, that isn't the only way to compete with the dollar. That's how Russia wants to compete with the dollar. Russia has wanted to put forward a single currency competitor with the dollar, either like a, a BRICS currency or, as Russia has asked for, the ruble can be that competitor. The problem is, though, and this is the problem with the Chinese currency being, the, being uh, the, this competitor or the Russian currency, is if you're going to make a world reserve currency, people need to trust that currency. With how much the Russians have kind of artificially manipulated their currency recently, not to mention the great amount of instability uh, around the ruble, I, I don't think anybody wants the ruble to be the world reserve currency. Chinese also manipulate the value of the currency for their national interests, which is not even something I'm saying, oh, that's so evil, but that's something they do. In fact, when the Russians, I believe they uh, ended up, tried to diversify their currency holds, and, and they got a bunch of, uh, of, of Chinese, a bunch uh, of of the Chinese currency and what happened? Chi don't say China bad. Don't say that in chat. Um, once they wanted to pull that out, when the situation got worse, they couldn't. The Chinese wouldn't let them. So a competitor, a direct competitor to the U.S. dollar, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. The amount of American world reserve currency in the world has gone down, even though 
these numbers are flawed because many nation states don't publish this data because it's for national security reasons. That direct competitor idea is a very long way off. The other idea that is floated, and de-dollarization is something that's talked about. Not This isn't the first time this issue has come up in the last 30, 40 years. This comes up every once in a while. The other idea is to have everybody trade in local currencies, which I mean, it, it seems that that does have more backing from other BRICS nations, but that still has yet to... That still has yet to see if it's going to work or not. We still have yet to see if that's going to succeed. With BRICS expanding again to a larger size, with many of these nation states having very, 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 very much so competing interests, I'm not saying it's completely worthless BRICS. I think the development bank that they're putting together could possibly have success, even though 90% of its funds come from the Chinese, so it's mostly just a Chinese development project. All I'm saying is that the hyperbolic way it's presented of the imminent collapse of the dollar is complete nonsense. It's complete nonsense, but that's something that Jackson Hinkle pushes a lot. But we'll listen to how, how, how he frames it. Maybe, maybe he'll be less hyperbolic and he'll say, hey, look at the development bank and hey, the amount of, uh, you know, the US dollar around the world, uh, how it's been res hold as world reserve currency, the public numbers have gone down. But you know, there's also other numbers that aren't published publicly by governments that they keep private for national security reasons. I want to see if he keeps it reserved and in, within reality or if he just narrative humps. Let's guess. Let's see. Um, you know, challenging the reserve currency status of the United States, right? Um, I, I guess first, right, because um, it's been a while since we've talked about reserve currency and petrodollar and everything else. Can you explain to people what the reserve currency status means and then how BRICS is going to challenge that and what you predict is going to happen? Of all the people that have explained to you reserve currency status, you get Jackson Hinkle. Why not like an economist? I don't even think I'm the best person to describe this. I mean, people will look up your own other people, people who know a lot more about this than me. Jackson Hinkle, he's your introduction to the reserve currency. Okay, let's hear it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, is he a gold standard guy? Is Jackson a gold standard guy? I don't think so. Well, right now, so since the 70s when Nixon was in power, you know, they decoupled the dollar from gold. I don't necessarily blame Nixon for that. I think it was scoundrels within his administration who can. Okay, so he is a gold standard guy. I, I immediately stand corrected. Never mind. It was the. <laughs> Nixon's okay. It was those scoundrels in the administration. All those scoundrels. Gotcha. Okay. He is a gold standard guy. Convince him to do that. It was a terrible decision. Mm -hmm. And since then, the petrodollar has been the single global reserve currency. So all these other currencies across the world, if they're having problems, if they're having uh, maybe these wealthy elites, City of London, Wall Street, they're taking advantage of inflation or deflation. They're speculating on a given country's currency and making millions and millions and millions or billions of dollars off of it in the process. For example, um, George Soros made his money by... Uh, no, really? You're going to... Soros? We're talking about... World Reserve Currency, we're already on Soros. Initially, I think he shorted the British pound. I think that's how he initially made oh. his money. So you, Before, when the British pound was still the um, the reserve currency of the world? No, but when the dollar's the reserve currency, you can manipulate markets. George Soros has made money through a, a bunch of different ventures. If if he made money off of shorting shorting the British pound, he must have had money before then. That's a... You know, you got to have money to make money situation to make those types of bets. Like if I said, like if I made a ton of money off of like a, like a big tech investment, I would have needed that money to make the investment. I don't know. Actually, I can, I can go look up how he made his original, how he made his original fortune. I'll look to that up off screen. I'm actually interested. It's in different currencies all across the yeah. world. Okay. So that's, that's how he made his initial money. I didn't and know that. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a, it was a big international dilemma. Um, there's a really good book. Matt Palumbo wrote uh, "The Man Behind the uh, The Man Behind the Curtain." It's a book about George Soros, and he talks uh -huh. all about that in the book. But you know, when you start to look at that stuff and you start to see what's happening in Africa, you start to see what's happened in all these Eastern and Central Asian nations for so long, and you understand that their people are suffering. But Africa is the okay. Here it is. <clears throat> Soros started his career working in British and American merchant banks before setting up his first hedge fund, Double Eagle, in 1969. Profits from this hedge fund pro uh, provided the seed money for Soros Fund Management, his second hedge fund in 1970. Double Eagle was remained Quantum Fund and was the principal from firm Soros Advised. At its founding, Quantum Fund had $12 million in assets under management. Got you. 
Soros is also known as the man who broke the Bank of England as a result of a short sale uh, of 10 billion worth of pounds sterling, which made him a profit of a billion dollars during the 1992 Bank Black Wednesday. Wait, so that happened 20 years after he managed the quantum fund. Okay, so he had a lot of money before then, though. Okay, got you. I didn't think... Because if you're going to short the bank, or if you're going to short the pound, you have to make money to put that money down to short it. You have to have money. Well, you have to have money to do that first. So I don't think that that's not how he originally made his money. He made that money later. The, you know, richest country or richest continent on the face of the earth when it comes to raw minerals, minerals and mm -hmm. resources. But what's happening, you have... You have their currencies that are destroyed by these international elite city of London, Wall Street. And after they do that, they go in and steal their uranium, steal their gold, steal their silver, steal their oil, steal their natural gas, sell it on international markets for pennies on the dollar. And that's what's happened for years. And for the first time now with BRICS and with these uprisings we're seeing in Africa and with other geopolitical events that we'll talk about on Rumble, it's changing that international order where the U.S., and Britain have been able to utilize the dollar as a tool of physical force on the rest of the world. So I don't really know how much the coup in Niger is going to affect dollar dominance or the coup in Gabon. Definitely since I, I believe the United States is probably moving pretty quickly to secure its interest in Gabon. Um, I mean, Niger is one of the poorest countries in sub-Saharan Africa. I don't know unless... We're going to see a massive turnaround in how the state is being managed, even though terrorism and uh, is, is still a major issue in the country. In fact, those groups seem to be gaining some ground right now. If you look at the it seems they're escalating attacks on military installations. I don't really know if that would be a great symbol of de-dollarization. Mm, gotcha. Um, and Bricks, the countries that are in it right now, because I know there's a it's Brazil. Uh, the R is Russia. 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 India, China, and then South Africa, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so 200 million, uh, 200 million USD was the capital posted for the trade that netted him 1 billion. Okay, so he already had 200 million dollars. Yeah, okay, 200 million dollars is not, yeah, he already had his initial money. He made money, he made money with these capital funds beforehand. In his mm -hmm. S. But there's been other countries that have been trying to get into it as well, right? Yeah, so there was just a BRICS summit in South Africa last week. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, they, they now have uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, Argentina, and Iran. And there's one, one more I'm missing off the top of my head. I always forget one. But uh, they brought in a bunch of new countries. And now they have, out of the top 10 oil-producing nations on the face of the planet, mm -hmm. they have seven, which are now BRICS member states. Only two of the top 10 are G7 states. It's the U.S. and Canada. And then I think the other one is Iraq, and they lean towards BRICS. They'll probably eventually be brought into BRICS. But is, is, that, is BRICS just like an old, like a, is this how he wants BRICS to be run? Or is this how BRICS is going to be run? Is it just letting everybody? Because originally India was against like opening BRICS up to like everyone. So is the, is the idea BRICS now is just going to let in everyone? Because I thought originally BRICS was supposed to compete with the G7. But if BRICS is just letting in literally everyone, how are they going to get anything done? And I'm not saying that, again, Development Bank, I think, is the main thing I would point towards. But how are you going to get all these nation states to agree if they're all, like, voting members in BRICS? I mean, you could barely get the countries that are already in BRICS to agree. Is it just going to be kind of like a like a conference that happens every few years that tries to organize some development plans? I don't know. We'll see. But um, they control most of the world's oil. They control, you know. When I say they control, it's that nations that are in BRICS have oil. It's not BRICS controlling the oil. Because, again, many of these nation states have completely competing interests. The Indians and the Chinese have border disputes, for God's sake. I think like 40 plus percent of the world's GDP now, and it's only going to continue to grow. There was I mean, we're going to get Iran and Saudi Arabia in BRICS. OK, so I Iran and Saudi Arabia. I think part of the reason they brought in Iran and Saudi Arabia together was because if they brought in Iran first, then they were never going to get in Saudi Arabia. And they brought in Saudi Arabia first. They're never going to get in Iran like 20 more countries that were very upset they weren't brought into the BRICS grouping during this most recent summit in yeah. Johannesburg. And uh, 
it's it's just I laugh and I say it's poetic justice because what has the U.S. done and what has Britain done for years and years and years? If they don't like Bashar al-Assad, they sanction him, they sanction his family, they sanction his administration and everyone in Syria. They prevent food and medical resources from entering the country. So, I mean, I don't think that's how I would describe why there was intervention in Syria would be because a bunch of people just didn't like Assad. I'd say the key factor of people who didn't like Assad that led to the uprising would be Syrians. Uh, there, there are U.S. sanctions on Syria. We did funnel weapons to rebel groups, but the Syrian civil war and the and the violence that came in afterwards is largely a fault of the regime being unable to deal with the discontent that rose up against them. They did that in Venezuela. They did that in Syria. They did that in Russia. Uh, we all know they've done it everywhere. And for the first, I like how like in all of these situations, he's not giving like any information as to why sanctions were in introduced. It's just, oh, we don't like them. Well, that could mean anything. Can you believe those Americans introduced sanctions on the Japanese just because we didn't like them? Which, by the way, I'm 99% sure that if this was 1938 America, Jackson Hinkle would 100% be one of the people with a sign outside of D.C. Why are we sanctioning the Japanese? You need to include that Japan was, in, was brutally invading half of Asia and would go on to invade basically all of Asia. There's a lot of information he's not including about Syria, about these situations. But, I mean, Jackson doesn't know that much about Syria. I've talked to him about Syria before. I had a debate with him on my main channel a while ago about Syria. I think it was like a year and a half ago. And he seemed to only really want to talk about the chemical attacks. He didn't really know anything about the football protests or anything about, you know, Assad's father or, like, the history of the country. It was mostly just chemical attacks, it seemed like time now we're beginning to see the ramifications of those policies biting them in the butt because all these countries got together and they said well you know if i have a border dispute that the united states doesn't agree with us on they're going to sanction us and, and utilize the dollar against us maybe utilize war against us if i have a water dispute with india that the united states doesn't agree with us on they're going to do the same thing so why don't we instead of trying to work with the united states wall street and the city of london let's all band together and just form a new world. And they're going to be doing that. They're going to be creating this new currency to challenge the dollar. That is the dumbest way they could do it too, man. Are they actually going to go through with that? I hope Jackson's right. That's the dumbest way to do it. That's the dumbest way to do it. I think, look, I thought like the, when the Chinese were talking about trading your local currency, I thought that made more sense. But the Russians want them to trade in their currency. They want to trade people to trade in the ruble. Why? Because it helps the ruble. That's why they want them to trade in the ruble. There is, what will be this currency? Again, the current stage is, here's the stage for current currency, currency reserves. 59% US dollar. And this is only what is publicly admitted to by states. There's probably a lot of countries that have more American dollar reserves that they aren't even admitting to. Because what's a smart investment compared to the other currencies? American dollar. Good to have it in reserves and a pickle. Definitely if you're some tip tin pot despot that maybe will need to flee their country in the middle of the night but 59 percent american dollar 20 percent euro 10 percent yen then you've got like canadian and australian then you've got the chinese currency then you've got it was either the canadian or australian then i think the swiss the swiss franc one of the main one of the competitors i've heard people people suggest is the swiss franc but I, I, I mean, you're gonna have to get them to, I guess, like, agree to that. But what, what's the, what's the competitor? I just want to hear the competitor, because like you can be in the, in the, like in the stands of a football game anytime, saying we're gonna come at you with a new player. A new player is gonna come out and he's gonna beat Kobe Bryant, man. He, he's got a, he's got a, he's got a deal. He's gonna, he's gonna sweep the floor with him. But until that manifests, like, just all talk. And so far, BRICS is mostly outside of the development bank, which is, I think, the strongest point. All talk. And again, the development bank is mostly just a Chinese project. It's going to be backed by a commodity of, you know, a uh, basket commodity of like uh, resources like oil, gas, maybe fertilizer. Who knows what we'll see. Um, and it's, it's going to eventually win. A, a fertilizer backed currency. OK. And I mean, there, there's no. It'll win. It'll win. He just said it'll win. Man, the currency hasn't even been created yet, and it will win.
Wow, man. He really is. He's got powers to see into the future. It The currency isn't even real yet, and it'll win. You know what? Turkey's going to lose the war against the incoming Kurdish rebellion. What Kurdish rebellion? Just wait. It'll come, and it'll win. I can make bold predictions like that with no evidence. Invest in Dogecoin. It'll win, guys. It'll win. Again, it's not even saying it's impossible, but you just don't have the evidence to make these types of assertions. He's, ma he's making assertions. He just doesn't have the information to, to confirm. Like I said earlier when we were talking about the amount of disinformation on Twitter, the recipe is keep it short, keep it simple, keep it hyperbolic. That's how you get attention. That's how you make money. That's the Jackson Hinkle strategy for success, man. Keep it short, simple, hyperbolic. Short, simple, hyperbolic, and serves the narrative. Easy answer to going back now in the state that our country's in. So, What does that mean for America itself? The Pro people. Probably, you know, the worst poverty we're going to have ever seen in our country. If Why is he so happy about it then? This, this is another thing I don't get about the Americans who are narrative humping about BRICS. Is that when you talk to them about what's going to happen if this, if this occurs... And it's the, like, the, it's, we're all going to die. It's the worst tragedy ever. Probably wouldn't be good for the United States. But also, he doesn't have the information to know that it would be economic ruination for the United States either. Right? But if, well, let's say he's right, though. That it is economic ruination. It's not, oh, that's going to slow down growth. Or, oh, that's going to mean we're going to have to balance the budget more. Right? Like, but it's economic ruination. If it is economic ruination... Why are you so excited? Why are we so happy about it? I would be terrified. I'd want the dollar to stay on top if it meant that like our we would all be poor. We would all starve or something, right? If not, you know, the worst poverty we're gonna have seen in a very long time. Um it it's not it's not a pretty picture, you know? And uh Already, we're beginning to see the impacts of this just on a, on a on a micro small microcosm. Look at what happened in Europe last year. So they got this great idea that they were going to sanction Russia. Europe is on the euro. They don't use the dollar. They use the second largest reserve currency, the euro. America's not in a recession. America's economically doing well. I think right now we're, we're between 3.5 to the lot. The highest estimate I saw was 5.9 GDP growth. We've got the lowest unemployment rate in a very, 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 very long time. Uh, we've got a very low employment rate when it comes to prime employment. We've got real wage growth for low earning income jobs. I'm not trying to say American economy is perfect. We've got a lot of problems. Uh, majority of Americans can't afford a $400 emergency. We still don't have health care coverage uh, uh, available to all Americans. Medicaid expansion still has not succeeded in a lot of states that desperately need it, like Mississippi and others. Um, I believe that we should go even further down the path of socialized medicine. There's a million pro different problems I can like talk about about the American economy. But he can't use the American economy as an example right now because the econo American economy is currently growing. Since Joe Biden has gotten in office, he has added about 14 million. We just got the jobs report for this month. 187,000 more jobs created. 14 million, I think, in total since Joe Biden has been in office. I think that's about 3.5 million more than the pre-COVID total because we lost a lot of jobs during the pandemic. So he has to go to Europe to talk about the dollar. Why not America? Europe's the euro. It's a different, different currency. And it was going to bring down the Russian economy and Putin was going to fall out of power. Then they were going to balkanize Russia, tear it into a bunch of small countries, whatever. That's not at all what the sanctions were meant to do. I mean, he can just like he can just say that if he wants. But no, nobody said that the purpose of this was to balkanize Russia. No government official. There was like two or three that said it would be good if Putin's regime went away. I think Biden even said that once during a meeting, which the White House then walked back. The purpose of the sanctions is to cripple the Russian war effort in Ukraine. It is to meet, make it so it, it can import less Western tech in order to uh, fight the war, make it harder for them to finance the war. And when it comes to how the economy is doing, well, it is harder for them to finance the war. 
That's 100% true. They have to go through a million workarounds to get the few pieces of tech and microchips and stuff that they can get in. A lot of it from China, some of it even from the United States. But the sanctions have had a very negative impact on the Russian economy. If that wasn't the case, they wouldn't go into those emergency uh, currency controls that they did when the sanctions went into place, which failed to stop the ruble from devaluing to worth less than a penny, an American penny. We're talking about de-dollarization. We just moved off of bricks. But are we really going to say America is facing this imminent de-dollarization and collapse when it's got 3.5 to 5% GDP growth? It's got economic problems, but it's stable. We're looking over at the Russians, the leader of a leader of the BRICS movement, this multipolar leader seeking the multipolarity of the states of the of the countries of the world, and its currency is worth less than a penny. A ruble's worth less than a cent. It it has had a negative effect on the Russian economy. If it didn't, then the Russians wouldn't be seeking paths to a you know, try to reverse the sanctions. And they also wouldn't be constantly complaining about the sanctions. If, if it was hurting the West more than it was hurting Russia, wouldn't the Russians be excited about the sanctions and not be fighting super hard to try to battle the sanctions and, and make it so the West reverses those decisions? But what happened? They sanctioned Russia. Russia said, okay, we'll sell our oil to India. We'll sell our oil to uh, China. China, of course. Uh, to You're chiming in, but... They can't sell the same amount of oil that they sold to Europe, to China and India. The infrastructure just isn't in place. You know, I think some people might have an image of like the oil and gas trade. That's like, there's like a bunch of oil barrels. You just kind of like put them on trucks and you kind of just drive them over to like a car or maybe like the car factory or something. You have to have infrastructure, pipes, pipelines, the backbone. They're, they're, the, they're the veins of, or of the oil and gas trade. And pipelines between Russia and Europe were plentiful. Pipelines between Russia, India, and China, not so much. They could not restore all of the oil and gas sales they were making in Europe in the Chinese and Indian markets. That's why the Chinese and Indian markets had to buy Russian oil and gas exports at a massive discount. To, to whoever needs it or wants it. And it also shows that you know, India and China are looking out for their own interests. It was because they're buying it at a massive discount because they know that they have more leverage than the Russians do because the Russians don't really have much of anywhere else to go. And uh, if you don't want to buy it, if you don't want to buy our LNG, then sure, you know, and then they, of course, the U.S. blew up the Nord Stream pipeline as well. And uh, I like how he just says things like with he doesn't need to really confirm it. He can just say it. And if he says it like boldly enough, he can just actualize it. Allegedly. Um <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> hey, man, we on YouTube. <laughs> All right. Radic Sk Sikorsky is admitted to that. He if I, let me just put it, let me put this out there. If if Russia can just be like, we don't care, who cares? Pff, whatever. We don't need to sell our, our 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 oil and gas to Europe. Why was the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline even a big deal? If that's the narrative. And why is it a big deal if they if they can do without selling the oil and gas to Europe? Why would they even care that much? He was a member of the European Parliament, so I think that's a fair point to make. But anyways, allegedly, um, and then <laughs> and then uh, so so now they're now they're left without LNG. What do we do? Okay, so um, they built up their liquefied nat or their natural gas reserves last winter. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty seasonably warm winter in Europe, so. They weren't Jackson Hinkle was one of the guys who were talking about Europe's going to freeze. It's going to freeze. And it didn't happen. Germany was able to regather oil and gas imports from other countries at a very fast rate, particularly Norway. Uh, I think they provide 40 to 41 percent of their oil and gas imports now. Then it's the Netherlands. Then it's Belgium. Then it's like some other states, which I think there's also like American LNG and stuff like that. Um that was part of the re it was it was both a semi war winter but it was also because europe really picked up pace in trying to get other sources that doesn't mean all of europe is no longer buying russian gas but europe is buying about like i think no basically like no oil and half of the amount of natural gas that they used to import from russia and it's only going to probably continue to go down if this war goes on for sure
strapped for energy with and even if the war was to stop tomorrow many european powers would feel unsettled just going straight back to the old relationship with russia knowing that if nothing really changes geopolitically something like this could happen again unless there's some guarantee to stop another russian invasion of ukraine or possibly russian invasions of other neighboring states like moldova with over 1500 russian troops stationed there and with uh, appearance from the kremlin that all post-soviet states are seemingly something that they believe that they can excise influence, tons of influence, even military force in. Without Russia, mm -hmm. but still, despite the fact that they had built up all the reserves, because they didn't have an easy access of liquefied natural gas from Russia, and because it was so expensive to build up their reserves, they spent billions and billions and billions of dollars to build up their reserves from all these random countries across the world they had to source it from instead of Russia, which was cheap and efficient. Norway's like right above Germany. It's not that far away. Netherlands, uh, Belgium, neighbors to Germany. I mean, like some of them are from farther away, but and they have like they've diversified their oil and natural gas imports, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. But it's the random countries uh, because of how expensive gas was all across Europe. The by the way, this is something that that Donald Trump was warning the Germans about, by the way, he's voting for Donald Trump. He's the person who he thinks should win. Donald Trump was telling the Germans to get off of Russian oil and gas, that they were too reliant on it. Economists predicted that 150,000 people died due to a lack of energy in Europe last winter alone, which is actually, and they reported this, and these are official, you know, CDC numbers, that's more deaths from a lack of energy than official CDC deaths in Europe during the same time span from COVID in the same time period last winter. Oh, wow. So it's a big deal. And that, that, that was nothing. No one talked about it. Imagine how bad it's going to get when... Things you really start to a change. Cold winter, yeah, yeah. Maybe this winter. You Question know? for you. Um, you meant I just don't. I mean, I'd have to go check those numbers. He has a very bad track record when it comes to manipulating numbers. I have to go check. It was says the economists. Was it? It was. Was it the economist? And by the way, if he really cares about people freezing to death due to lack of electricity, where was his anger when the Russians were targeting the Ukrainian electrical grid? all across Ukraine during the winter with Russian state media openly admitting that the purpose was to freeze the Ukrainians. That was the purpose. And what would he, did he, by the way, did he, somebody just brought this up. Did he say the official CDC numbers for Europe? They reported this, a lack of energy in Europe last winter alone, which is actually, and they reported due to cheap, all these random countries across the world they had to source it from instead of Russia, which was cheap and efficient. Uh, because of how expensive gas was all across Europe, the economist predict- I thought it was the economist. Somebody said it was the CDC. He said it was the economist. Of course not the CDC. That's an American, American outlet. Not an American outlet, an American government institution. I actually looked this up quick. Economist, 150,000 dead electric. Oh my God, this lying sack of shit. He said 150,000 dead. He actually did. He definitely said CDC. He said CDC later. Wait, did he? CDC numbers. 150,000 people died due to a lack of energy in Europe last winter alone, which is actually, and they reported this, and these are official, you know, CDC numbers, that's more okay, death. Okay, you know, he did say CDC numbers. So I don't want to be the guy to break this to anyone, but the CDC, I don't know why they would, why would they even gather numbers on, on this? Because th that's, that's Europe, that's not the United States. So I, I don't know why they said it was CDC numbers. It wasn't CDC numbers. I just found it. It's from The Economist. I don't know what he meant by the CDC. But also, it's not 150,000, right? It's a guesstimate, right? He's making it sound like here's the official numbers that have been published by the CDC. CDC is a government organization. Number one, these are not the official numbers published by the CDC. So let's put that out first. Second thing is, it's a model. So they're estimating. So this is an estimate, right? And of the estimate that they put out, they said that it was 68,000. So that's one third what he said. And even of that number, if you go and you dig through the data, it's actually 22,000 is the lowest estimate, with the highest estimate being 138,000, which is still 12,000 less than his estimate, which he said was the number.
to 60,000 right here. Is this the number he's talking about right here? It's the next one. Do do do. Across 20 European countries, we investigated. There was 180, 149,000 excess deaths between November 22 and February 2023, equivalent through 7.8% increase. So this is the 150,000 number, but this is, this is the weeks of 2015 to 2019. You might expect, given the morality, we found the excess uh, to be higher than expected. 149,000 excess deaths between February 2022 to February 2023. So this would be the number he was talking about. But then it says right here, it's 68,000 lives. So is he taking a number? What if it leads with the 68,000 lives? So this is a wide estimate, and he took the worst possible number out of the estimate when it leads with, it was actually probably 86,000. No, 68,000. Okay. So it's not CDC numbers. And the estimate is a much wider range. This is still, by the way, this is still bad. But this is the problem with Jack Sinkle. Like I said earlier, I didn't trust his numbers because I know he does stuff like this all the time. Well, number one, he's saying an agency, a government agency, to give it a lot more credibility than the numbers have. This is an estimate, which could mean that this is wrong. There isn't official government numbers on this, right? So we this could be right, or the methodology, which I wonder if he could explain the methodology, haven't even looked at the methodology, not official numbers, so he cannot confirm that we know that. He said we know 158,000 died. That is the highest possible estimate when even the article he is citing says it was actually probably one third of that. Okay, whatever. Whatever, but that's always how, again, simplify, simplify, don't make it too complicated. You can't, you can't make it, uh, you can't try to get into the details. Don't do that. Uh, make sure it serves the narrative. It serves the narrative, Russia destroying Europe. So we gotta make sure it serves the narrative. Gotta put that out there. You simplify, make sure it serves the narrative. And then you exaggerate, you you end as much as, as make it as hyperbolic as physically possible. This is the pattern. That's from a lack of energy than official CDC deaths in Europe during the same time span from COVID in the same time period last winter. Oh, wow. So it's a big deal. And that, that, that was nothing. No one talked about it. Imagine how bad it's going to get when things you really start to change. Cold winter. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this winter. You Question know? for you. Um, you mentioned that uh, the, the, obviously the, U, the, the U.S. reserve currency status is propped up through Saudi Arabia and oil and uh, the deal that Nixon struck back in the, in the 70s. Um, Saudi Arabia isn't so happy with us right now. What do you see was going with that since the reserve currency status is so contingent upon oil that comes from Saudi Arabia? Yeah, we've always had a bit of a fraught relation, good relationship, but it's, you know, had its problems with Saudi Arabia Yeah, over issues we can't talk about here. But um, you can, you can talk about the relationship on YouTube. You know, Saudi Arabia is... 9-11. Is that what he wanted to say? 9-11. Saudi hijackers. Look, you can say it out loud. It's not... You're not going to get shot. You're, you're fine. Not to mention, I thought he was already demonetized. Whatever. I guess I guess maybe if he says 9-11 out loud, we'll get to you know, demonetize their channel, a uh, channel as well. Is It's so interesting because I think they've had it too. They see what's happening. I just hate the beating around the bush. I don't like it. ...happening with uh, Joe Biden. I think they look at Joe Biden and they see a clown in the White House. And they've also seen how the world is shifting. The power centers are shifting to Russia and China. Do you, does anybody actually think world leaders think this way? That world leaders think like, you know, like a, like a YouTube commenter, like, you know, I was looking at Biden walking the other day. He walked super slowly, weak. I'm, I'm exiting this trade deal with the United States. Your leader is too old. Your leader is too old in the West. So I'm going to go get with the young, hip, and spry Vladimir Putin who looks like he's one step outside of death's door at the age of 70. China. China's going to surpass our economy very soon. Uh, Russia's actually moving up. Russia, for the first time in the past 14 years, they're now one of the top 10 economies in the world. Mm. In terms of purchasing power parity, they're the fifth largest economy in the world. They passed Germany and the UK and France this year. So Russia's doing... Purchasing power parity. He's got to get so specific. Purchasing power parity. So purchasing power parity is how much a dollar will go within Russia. That is what he's talking about to try to talk about the strength of the Russian economy. So, by the way, 
You're talking about purchasing power parity, right? You can you can do this with a lot of states where a dollar will go further. That doesn't mean the economy is necessarily stronger than the other economies. It doesn't mean that it, you have more wealth or the people or are living above the poverty line at a higher rate. Very specific indicator he's trying to point to. Uh, can we talk about the more than a million Russians who have fled the country because their jobs have fled the country, all the companies that have pulled out, all the capital that's pulled out, or the currency reserves that have been frozen overseas, the people who have fled Russia in waves to get away from the mass conscription, the amount of prime working age population men in a country that's already going through a demographic crisis that have been shoveled into the front line to not make something for the Russian government or the Russian state or the economy that's productive, like say programming software or start a factory, anything like that. No, they go off to the front line and they die. The Russian economy is not, is not doing great right now. Government revenues, just to paint a picture for how it's not going great. Government revenues in Russia have decreased by more than 50% while military expenses have gone up by over 200%. Purchasing power parity is a very specific thing to look at. He used to talk about the ruble during these rants a lot more, talk about the strength of the ruble, but the ruble is now worth less than a penny. So now not a point he can make anymore, even though when he was making the point, he was making the point at a period where the Russian ruble was artificially inflated through government controls. If you were trying to trade the ruble on the black market, you get a much worse price, much worse price. I think somebody donated a tier one sub, Arius385. Thank you for the tier one, appreciate it. Better than in a number of years. China's doing better than ever before. Um, in the United States, however, we lost 1 million millionaires last year. Mm. One one million millionaires. One million millionaires, did we? One million millionaires we lost. Russia went up $600 billion in wealth. As a whole, the U.S. lost $5.9 trillion. So this right here is just narrative humping. He's, he's trying to find very specific facts to try to craft a narrative of the Russian economy that's thriving, even though California, as, as when, it comes to percent, when it comes to GDP, is larger than Russia. California alone has a larger GDP than Russia. Now, I'm not trying to say that Russia, ha you know, is, is like a pathetic economy with no power, but the Russians have not benefited from this war and the economic situation domestically has only gotten worse in Russia. It has only gotten worse. When we talk about having your prime age population your prime working age population getting cut down by machine guns, when you're already going through a demographic crisis, and a million of them are fleeing the country because of work or fear of conscription, that, that's not investing in your long-term future. Really, I, I have a fear, and I know this is not a big fear for Ukrainians, but I think it should be a fear for people in Russia, that Russia, even if it somehow wins this war, whatever winning is, that it is that it has hurt its economy so hard, it has, it has, it has fallen on the sword so brutally, it has sacrificed so many people that, you know, some, some things like demographics are a lot harder to undo the damage of. There's, there's, like, we haven't seen the, the deep long-term effects of what's happening to the Russian economy, and we probably won't see it for years. We're seeing some of the effects, but there's still going to be more time that goes on with more Russians dying in the trenches, more leaving the country and more and more money allocated to the war effort, especially if they go through another wave of mobilization, which many people suspect they're already raising the conscription age from the, the top limit from 27 to 30 to try to catch more people in the net and throw them towards Ukraine. So he's just, he's just trying to paint a very specific picture by choosing very specific facts to try to paint the economy like, like it's looking fantastic. I remember, I mean, if you could do this with any country too. I'm pretty sure if I went to Central Africa, I could find certain facts to talk like, did you know when it comes to the security industry in Central Africa, employment's up 200%? Wow, booming job market. Now, if I just leave out the fact that the reason why the security industry is booming is because of terrorism, instability, and a lack of central government control, then I can make it sound like things are really going up in Central Africa. They're making a ton of bodyguards over there. If you leave out certain information, you cherry pick, you can, uh, you can create uh, a lot of disinformation using sometimes even real numbers. As in, 
if I wanted to show the American economy thriving during the Great Depression, if I cherry picked certain numbers and how certain companies or certain sectors of the economy was doing, I could paint a, a picture that is very misrepresentative. What's your, sorry, I wanted you to finish your thought before I ask the question. All, all I got to say is, I mean, the writing's on the wall. Saudi Arabia yeah. sees what's happening. Yeah. They know where they know where the money's going to be coming from next. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be coming from the U.S., which is in economic decline. It's a, it's slow right now, but everyone sees what's on the horizon. And they're trying to go electric and all this other crap. So, yeah. Understand. All of the money. Of course, they're going to go electric. So abandon America. I didn't think of that. What's that even mean? What? Who is this? Or, yeah. Well, Tesla. Yeah. 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 I mean, you I, they still okay so they're going electric but look at all the billions they and the, all the propaganda they push about renewable energy right yeah it's not renewable it's it we all know that it, it's it's extremely detrimentous to the we environment we all know that renewable energy named renewable energy is not renewable i'm sure that's why everyone calls it renewable energy is because everyone knows it's not renewable that's why everyone calls it renewable energy everyone knows this no it doesn't just in your 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 mega communist bubble on the internet you know it and you all just, you know, you've lived in that bubble, so you leave that bubble, and then you assume everyone else knows it. Environment yeah. and uh, expensive. It's expensive, and like, it's remember when remember when Vivek got booed for that climate change agenda comment at the RNC debate? Those very, don't do shit. It's low efficiency. Yeah, and fossil fuels are highly efficient, low cost, but the real answer is nuclear fusion. Yeah. I think that we need nuclear fusion everywhere across the world. Right now, of course, just building more fission reactors. Mm -hmm. But um, the, I mean, the price of solar is go is getting cheaper and cheaper. I, like You can only hold out against solar for so long, man. You can't. Actually, I believe nuclear power is getting more expensive. That's not. I'm not saying nuclear power is bad. I'm just saying I believe it's actually getting more expensive. Saudi Arabia, they just contracted China after they accepted uh, Saudi Arabia into the BRICS grouping, they just contracted China to build, Contract. I think it was like a, a multi-billion dollar nuclear power plant, something to that effect, a huge, huge under- Okay, I think I'm done here. I don't really know what else I would want to comment on in this. Um, I don't think I want to see anything else here. I don't think we're going to get anything anything original anything different than what we would usually get and it was basically we're getting towards the end of the stream anyway okay that's enough of that yep but those two hosts took it hook line and sinker gave no pushback just accepted it all on face value fantastic maybe if if jackson hinkle was a woman maybe they would have given more pushback maybe if he was like a like a woman in a crop top from only fans that they brought on for that reason maybe they would have gone a little bit more aggressive